Senator Cantwell has been leading the charge to create 400,000 additional affordable units over 10 years by expanding the, tax, the low income housing tax credit program by 50% and implementing other changes to improve the effectiveness of this extremely important source of financing that by some estimates is responsible for nearly 90% of the affordable housing being produced as well as nearly one third of all comparably affordable apartments in the US. In 2015, she helped to author a critical fix for the low income housing tax credit program by permanently extending the credit rates to a fixed 9% instead of what had been a fluctuating rent rate set by formula, which added predictability and stability for the financing of development. Her leadership in this regard has really just been nothing short of extraordinary. Uh, having secured Senator Hatch as an original co-sponsor for the Affordable Housing Credit Improvement Act, there are now 22 co-sponsors, 10 Republicans, 11 Democrats, and one Independent. And this level of bipartisan support is uh, very impressive, and I think we can all appreciate how impressive it is that the committee chairman has agreed to support this bill as one of just two specific bills in the run-up to tax reform. Something else you should know, Senator Cantwell has been absolutely tireless in promoting the bill. She has made numerous appearances in Washington State as well as nationally. And whenever she visits an affordable housing project, one of the first things she asks is to meet with a resident. She listens to their story and she takes that information back to senators here in Washington, D.C. So please join me in welcoming Senator Maria Cantwell. Well, thank you and good afternoon. And a special good afternoon to all the Washingtonians from my side of the country. I know that there are several here, and so thank you for your focus and thank you for attention to affordable housing. Thank you, Jennifer, for that introduction, and thank you to the National Association of Affordable Housing Lenders for hosting the event. The work that you do makes housing more affordable, and as we all know, this is so important to people across the United States. Affordable housing is a crisis in the United States. It's just as real a crisis as Irma or Maria or Harvey. And while I would say that those things need attention, this persistent problem of affordable housing has long-term implications that need addressing now. This past February, more than 2,000 families packed into the new Holly Gathering Hall in South Seattle. Each family was hoping to hear its name called. It wasn't a contest, it wasn't a game, it was a lottery. A lottery to see which family would get an affordable housing unit. Mercury Othello Plaza would open soon, 108 affordable units. And yet 108 units for more than 2,000 families just wasn't going to get the job done. Based on the number alone, their chances of getting an affordable home was lower than an applicant's chance of getting into Harvard. 95% of the families attending that night would be disappointed and continue to search for an affordable solution. This is just one of the many examples that we are seeing all across the United States. The crisis impacts every single state and every community, whether you're urban or rural. As I have traveled across my home state, and the country talking with those most hard hit, I see families and veterans and elderly and displaced individuals all suffering over the fact they don't have an affordable option. The most damning part of this crisis is we know how to solve it. We know what needs to happen, we just need the courage to act. We need the confidence that working together, we literally can make a difference here. For decades, housing growth was one of the most stimulative parts of our economy. Throughout the 80s, housing was 18% of our country's GDP. Today, that number has dropped to just 15%. When people discuss tax reform and GDP growth, housing is still one way we can generate economic growth. I like to say whether it was the 60s or 70s or 80s, usually there was a cheer that went up for housing. In the economic downturn, you haven't heard that cheer anymore. Housing has, however, increasingly become 
a key economic factor in the stability of American families and communities. Over the past 50 years, the share of American families paying more than they can afford in rent has doubled. 20 million Americans, including 11 million renters, are spending more of their half their income on housing. So that means less money for all the other essentials, whether that's food or health care. The National Low Income Housing Coalition tells us that 7.4 million more affordable homes are needed, and this gap has increased by 60% since 2000. There is not a single state in the entire country where someone working on a minimum wage job can afford to pay an affordable rent. The United States literally has become a rent burdened economy. And the crisis is only going to get worse. One study done earlier this year found that with no action over the next 10 years, nearly 15 million Americans spending half of their monthly income on rent will see that increase to 25%. So what was the cause of this crisis? How did we get here? Well, first of all, the 2007 housing crash pushed millions of families into rental markets and reduced wages of working families. The demand for rental housing <clears throat> skyrocketed, has skyrocketed since the financial crisis. Over 7 million Americans lost their homes to foreclosure, causing a demand for affordable housing to grow. Today, home ownership rates are at their lowest level since the mid-60s. And over the last 10 years, the number of renters has grown to 9 million, the largest gain in any 10-year period on record. So the demand for rental housing shows no sign of slowing down in the future. Millennials are like, likely to rent instead of own. We have veterans who are coming back and looking for housing, retirees and elderly who are moving into rental properties in larger numbers as well. So what about on the supply side if we have seen this increase in demand? Well, at the same time, the supply side of affordable housing has failed to keep pace with the increase of the number of renters. Affordable housing stock is being converted into market-based rate units. A new report by Freddie Mac found that the number of apartments deemed affordable for very low-income people dropped by 60% over the last five years. So the supply and demand show a crisis. But what about new production? Has it filled the gap? Production of affordable housing is at its lowest 10-year production rate since 1974. So the rising rents have constantly outpaced inflation, and low-wage workers have barely gotten any wage increase over the last 15 years. So the combination of increased demand and lack of production is what is primarily driving this explosion in the affordable housing crisis. I can tell you in Seattle, <clears throat> it is a very real crisis. From 2000, and, from 2000 to 2013, the number of Americans facing extreme affordability has exploded. So now we're up to 11.2 million Americans. And now on top of this, a season of disaster that has made this even more complex. In the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, Congress passed an expansion of low-income tax credit that cost about $1.1 billion to build 28,000 affordable units on the Gulf Coast but more than 275,000 homes were destroyed. So this was hardly enough to catch us up. The low income tax credit did help rebuild, but it did not solve the housing crisis in New Orleans, which today has a 35% higher rate over the, since the storm in unaffordable uh, individuals seeking housing. So now 12 years later, another disaster has hit and we still need to address the underlying problem and now the exacerbation of these storms. The housing burden for extremely low income families in Texas and particularly families in the Texas major metro areas is now among the worst in the nation. It has 29 affordable apartments for every 100 people who are now in that category. Houston is the third worst country in the, in the country for available housing for extremely low income individuals. And many families in Florida and Puerto Rico are going to find even more difficult situations in affordable housing. So we need to do both. We need to address the most recent 
crisis and disaster, but we have to adhere and face up to the underlying crisis that has been persistent now for more than a decade. We need to address both the natural disasters and the underlying disaster. Well, the good news is we actually know how to do this. And that is why Senator Hatch and I have introduced the Affordable Housing Credit Improvement Act, a bill that would increase the annual allocation of income housing tax credits by 50%, allowing the creation of over 400,000 additional units in the next 10 years. As mentioned, this bill has attracted bipartisan co-sponsorship, and we just added two more senators, Senator Scott and Senator Kane, just this past week. But now is not just the time to say that it's bipartisan. The time is now to say that it is urgent that we act. The tax credit helped to develop or preserve 3 million homes and provided 7 million low-income families with affordable solutions. And enacting this credit, the additional 452,000 jobs that would be created over the next 10 years is a great shot in the arm to our economy. This, I think, as we look at the House package of tax proposals, is how you stimulate an economy and grow jobs, housing. This is what we need to do in the area of construction, where more than 2.6 billion jobs alone would be supported. And we can also get savings by putting a roof over people's head. One study found that placing people in affordable housing lowered federal Medicaid expenditures by an average of 12%. And a University of Pennsylvania study found that taxpayers could save $16,000 per homeless person placed in an affordable housing unit. Housing provides the investment and job creation that historically contributed to true GDP growth between 2 and 4% each year since the 1980s. And putting a roof overhead of families today not only gives them an affordable housing solution, it helps us grow our economy in areas that are so key for us for the future. So we need to get about this task of realizing a bipartisan solution that has existed and to understand one key point about this crisis. That is that 90% of the affordable units that have been built in the United States have been built with this public-private partnership, bipartisan-supported solution. That is to say that if we don't increase the amount of capital going to the tax credit, it's very unlikely, if not a certainty, that we will not get out of this crisis and, again, just see the continued increase in the amount of unaffordable Americans living in this situation. Now is the time to act. I hope our colleagues will take this up before the end of the year and see that we can not only stimulate the economy, but help us save dollars and put families in a more secure situation. Thank you all very much, and thank you for your support. I wasn't sure whether I was supposed to answer any questions. <laughs> First of all, Senator Cantwell, <clears throat> speaking for everybody in this room, we all think that you're a hero. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you're obviously also a talented um, persuader, because we have Orrin Hatch as your co-sponsor. Co uh, do you think you can work your wonders again with Senator Cornyn from Texas? Um, we've had several conversations, and I think he is supportive. You know, we should ask him that question, but my sense is that if it came up for a vote, uh, he's given us indications that it's something that he would like to support. So I, I think that that... Uh, the discussion has been good. One of the reasons we went to Senator Hatch to begin with was because their state, Utah, had done such a fabulous job of housing all their veterans. They basically just said, you know what, we don't even care why someone is homeless. If you're a veteran, we're going to put a roof over your head. And it was a very successful program. And they have uh, led the nation in that. And I think that uh, that was one of the reasons why Senator Hatch joined on. 
but you can make sure he, that the answer is yes, okay? You can go, you can go back to him. Uh, Senator, I'd like to uh, echo what Fred said. Uh, we greatly appreciate your advocacy and tenacity in, in behalf of affordable housing. Uh, just this morning, we learned that the Ways and Means Committee did retain uh, the housing credit and tax reform, but did repeal the tax exemption for private activity bonds, which finance about 40% of uh, all housing credit uh, apartments each year. What is your recommendation to us on how we should deal uh, with this development and advocacy going forward in this tax and reform environment? Well, I definitely think that the larger debate from the White House has been around this public-private partnership message, and yet when it comes to the tax code, why would you throw out things that are a successful example of that, whether it's that or the new market tax credits? I would be back at them. I mean, look, everybody has a different philosophy depending on what part of the country they're from, and, but to me, if you can put a very small amount of federal dollars on the table and leverage 25 or 35 times that investment from the private sector by just putting that capital on the table, this is a very smart use of taxpayer uh, funds to meet the goals that we would like to meet. So I would go back to them and say, these have been the most successful programs, why would you why would you cut them? Okay, thank you all very, very much.